Excellent. Um, thank you very much for inviting me here today. And um, as the guy said, I'm going to be talking to you about invasive species release and control. There's going to be an underlying um, message which I'd like you to think about as we go through the lecture of when is a message that's clear not a good thing and when should a bit of complication be introduced. So let's start with what is the problem of invasive species. We have to take a step back and look at our planet. Over the last tens of millions of years, in some cases hundreds of millions of years, species and communities of species have evolved in separate pockets around the globe. They've been separated by barriers such as mountain ranges and oceans and in some places the climate itself stops invasive species from travelling across a barrier. Now, since about the 1500s, we've started to break down these barriers to a significant extent, taking species from one of these pockets, transporting them and releasing them into a new area, sometimes deliberately, often accidentally. These species then compete with native species in a particular area and can exterminate the species in some cases. And when that happens, we get global loss of biodiversity. Before um, we go further into the talk, I'd just like you guys to think about the sort of emotional charge of this subject. Just for, for the next minute, really care about this subject and look at these terms that we've got. Um, invasive, alien, they've all got a kind of a charge to them. We're not dealing with an emotion-free type of subject. Um, oh, exotic, quite nice. Um, and maybe even colonizer, maybe that's a more neutral term, maybe not. But as we go through this um, talk, be aware of the emotions that are being invoked when we're thinking about species coming in here. So let's start with a nice clear message. We are helpless. Um, I've got a selection of invasive species here. I'm using particularly invasive species that have come into the UK because that's what I know most about, but this sort of thing is happening across the globe. So if we start off with this going clockwise from the top right, we've got Dicrogamorus villosus, otherwise known as the killer shrimp. Um, this species is, when it turns up in a new um, waterway, it's a freshwater shrimp, when it turns up in the fresh water, it can cause significant um, changes to the environment just by the fact that it's such an aggressive species. Queen's University Belfast carried out work on this species um, in Northern Ireland. They put it into aquariums with other freshwater invertebrates and it just attacked everything and it killed things, didn't even eat them, just bit holes in them. So it's a really aggressive species. Moving on to the Chinese mitten crab, the Chinese mitten crab can travel up to 5,000 kilometres upstream in its native China. So think about the lengths of our rivers, think about how far this animal can travel. It's also a predator. It also undermines riverbanks, so it can have an effect on us. Looking at the next species, the American signal crayfish, not only does it carry a nasty disease which kills our own native crayfish, it also um, is an aggressive predator. It can also travel over land small distances. I know this because I've trodden on one once while walking around a pond. Um, and then finally, we can look at this um, another invasive species, Japanese knotweed. Now, a tiny fragment of Japanese knotweed can find itself into a, in, in the soil and can proliferate into a new plant and can then proliferate into a whole new patch of this really difficult to kill plant. And not even our buildings are safe. This um, plant is reputed to be able to burrow its way through solid concrete. So, it's almost as if, if you just quietly listen for a second, you might be able to hear the creak as roots push their way through concrete nearby. And maybe you can even hear the gentle patter of crustacean feet as they surge up our rivers and into our ponds and across our land. And we're helpless. But are we helpless? Um, there, there are cases where we've taken on invasive species and we've been successful. 
So there are two species here. Uh, the one on the left is Calerpa taxifolia. This is a, um, a, an algae that at the moment is surging its way around the Mediterranean. Um, notice my motive use of the word surge. Um, but it's working its way around the Mediterranean at the moment. It's displacing seagrass beds and all the things that live on seagrass beds in the Mediterranean. When it first turned up in California, the United States authorities very quickly got onto the case of eradicating it. Every patch of calerpa they found um, in the bays around California, they managed to put plastic sheeting over it, weigh the plastic sheeting down, and then pump chlorine under the plastic sheeting, killing the calerpa. Killed everything else under the plastic sheeting, but it controlled the calerpa. Another example, this animal is called a koipu. Um, it's uh, related to beaver. And um, it turned up in the Norfolk Broads, and a successful eradication program was carried out in the Norfolk Broads and eradicated it by the late 1980s. So we can, in some cases, control invasive species. One issue is that this relatively small invasion of Calerpa cost the United States government around about $7 million for a small beginning of an invasion. This Koipu invasion in the mid to late 1980s cost three million pounds to control. So we're talking significant resources and significant difficulty to control invasive species. So yes, we're mainly helpless. I've put this picture of the killer shrimp up again because um, there are reports of people who've carried out fly fishing coming out of fly fishing with these animals stuck to their boots and stuck to their waders. So by, in this case, individuals cleaning their waders or cleaning fishing gear, they could at least slow down the rate of an invasion. But that's broadly what we're left with. It's not nice feeling helpless. So should we do something anyway? Some work carried out by my colleague, Dr. Tim Smith. Um, he looked at a plant called Crassula helmsii, Australian water stonecrop. This plant is physiologically a little bit like a cactus, and it lives in fresh water. It's a really tough plant. I'd just like to illustrate what it looks like, so you can see behind me one, of, one picture of a lake in winter and another picture of the same lake in summer, and you can see the effect that Crassula has had, or all of that light green vegetation is Crassula. So it's growing and significantly it looks like it's choking the, um, the, the pond that is there. Here we've got a picture of Crassula quite happily growing in ice. Um, now, Tim looked at the effect of Crassula and the impact of Crassula. And to do that, he looked at ponds in the UK, or sorry, in Kent, where you found Crassula and where you didn't. And he looked at what else was there. He found some strange things, some strange patterns in terms of the, um, the, the, the aquatic plants that were growing alongside Crassula. He also looked at the seed bank. He also looked at the invertebrates. Overall, didn't find a difference in species richness where you found Crassula and where you didn't. Where he did find an impact was where Crassula had been actively managed. So how do you actively manage Crassula? You do it with a digger. You take a digger, you scrape out all of your plants, and unfortunately when you do that, you also in some cases scrape out the native seed bank as well. So in some cases, active management can cause a problem. There is good news. We can carry out some sorts of management, maybe not to control the invasive species. Perhaps we can just give our native species a better chance. These two species, the sad looking one at the front is a water vole. Um, the one look at, the, at the back that looks like it's ready to go is an American mink. American mink like to eat water voles. In fact, they've, they've eaten so many water voles that they've significantly impacted water vole populations in the UK. So, um, some work carried out at Raw Holloway found out that you can make a mink's life more difficult you can grow wide margins of vegetation around your river, which makes it more difficult for the mink to find water voles, and it lowers the predation rate of water voles. We can't get rid of American mink now. Functionally, it would cost, 
I'm speculating something like our defence budget. But what we can do is we can manage our environments to make the American mink's life more difficult and to give our native species more of a chance. We can look at things in the long term as well. So um, just to trace a pattern of an invasion, you start off with very small numbers of invasive species. And after a period of time, that invasive species, the numbers start to explode. You get a large number having a large impact on the ecosystem. At that point, often, something happens. Either a pathogen comes in or a predator comes in or a competitor starts to compete. And that invasive species numbers then drop back down and it becomes part of the background fauna. This was the case with this species, Potamopergus antipodarum, a New Zealand mud snail. It turned up in the UK, it's thought to have turned up in 1859. Surged up our rivers in large numbers. Um, and then over time, the species has diminished. If you put a pond net into a river today, you'll generally find one or two Potamopergus in, in, in lots of your samples, but you won't find the huge numbers having the huge impact that you would have found when it first invaded. Similar point with this species, it doesn't have a common name, so we'll call it a tube shrimp. So the tube shrimp turned up in 1934 in the UK, and um, it had a population explosion in the mid-1990s, and by about 2000, the populations had seemingly collapsed. Its range had decreased in the UK. Nowadays, you'd be hard-pressed to find it in much of its former range. So there's, there's hope with long-term for individual species invading. So overall, what can we do? We've looked at eradication. Sometimes it works, but only if you catch an invasion right at the beginning. Generally speaking, we don't notice invasions until they've become quite significant, with a few notable um, exceptions. You could try clever habitat management to give your native species the best chance they can possibly get. To do that, we need to know what clever habitat management looks like. We need more ecologists. I would say that. Um, we also need to, if we can, slow down invasions, giving um, ecosystems a chance to deal with invasions as they're coming in. If you get too many invasions hitting at the same time, you get a phenomenon called in, um, invasion meltdown, ecosystem meltdown, and the whole um, ecosystem can collapse. Finally, if we can slow down invasions, with certain invaders, maybe wait and see. It took 100 to 150 years for us to see what was happening with Potamopergus. What can you do right now? Maybe not right now. Um, one thing you could do is if you travel from one habitat to another, you don't know what invasive species look like. You might have some on your shoes. I've walked, I've done a survey in woodland, not bothered cleaning my boots, and then a couple of weeks later looked at my boots and found plants growing out of the mud on the bottom of them. So clean your shoes. If you're a type that likes putting on waders and jumping into rivers, then clean your waders. That's the sort of level of the things that you can do to help with invasive species. However, there's a question of what we do in the long term. What we can see in the long term, we can look at the um, things that have happened in the past. So here we have two faunas. I'd, I'd recommend that you look these up if, you, if you're interested. There are, um, if you look at the Ediacaran fauna, it's an assemblage of different organisms. There is very little there that you'll recognise from today. If you look at the Burgess shale fauna, there's very little in that fauna, in the diversity there that you'll recognise today. We've had a number of mass extinctions. For example, the Permian mass extinction, we lost 96% of our species. However, that led to, um, we've, we've had proliferation today, back to some, you know, to, to, we've got a high level of diversity today. We're going through potentially a mass extinction at the moment caused by things such as invasive species. The point about past mass extinctions is whatever was causing them finished. 
And so one thing we can do is try to slow down and stop invasions, but also start to engage with the really difficult question of how do we stop doing all of these things that we're doing that are causing these impacts in the long term. I'm talking in the next 10,000 years. And if we can start to engage with that really difficult question, not a clear message, a knotty problem for us to work with, if we can engage with that, then we can hopefully have a more positive effect with invasive species. That's everything I wanted to say. Thank you very much.